Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we meet a drone company taking Marines to new heights and continue our conversation with the head of the UK's Royal Air Force. Plus, we learn about a harrowing Coast Guard rescue, a missile launch in France, and how funds from the border are going back to the Pentagon. And later, information warfare at sea, we learn how the Navy is upping its IW game. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. We have a great show for you this week and a lot to cover, so let's get started. First up, the military has long been looking for innovative ways to resupply troops in a safe and efficient way. Not unlike how Amazon wants to use drones to deliver your packages to your doorstep, the Marines want unmanned aerial vehicles to drop things like food and ammunition to squads on the battlefield. To further that effort, in 2020, the Corps held a competition for companies to show off their drone's abilities to perform supply drop missions. Reporter Todd South went to the headquarters for one of the winners of that competition, Periscope Aviation. So one of the things the Marine Corps is looking at now is how to resupply disparate units uh, across big distances. Now they have to start small um, in short, shorter ranges where the technology really exists, but they're trying to build off of that from smaller payloads and shorter distances to bigger payloads and larger platforms. So here's a company that's doing that right now. Uh, about two years ago, the Marine Corps had a prize competition for tactical resupply, bringing supplies to an LZ, dropping them and returning home. The Mark IV-R, the smaller drone, can lift about 60 pounds and flew out 10 kilometers out, dropped the payload and returned. From there, the Marines wanted to lift more weight, so we developed the Mark IV-RX. Mark IV-RX can lift 135 pounds, and that can fly out 10 kilometers and fly back 10. We see the industry needing to go bigger and longer and heavier payloads to be more realistic and more uh, usable. So at Periscope Aviation, our next design is going to be focused around 400 to 500 pound lift uh, with similar ranges. So are these drones easy to set up? Are they easy to transport? Are they easy to tear down? That's one of the things they're considering right now as they develop these types of drones. So what we're looking at here is Periscope Aviation's Mark IV RX, heavy lift drone for tactical resupply. It can lift anywhere from 60 pounds to 135 pounds and travel anywhere from 20 kilometers to 40 kilometers. The design is intended to be highly portable and rapidly deployable, to go from case to air in less than five minutes, and to pack up into small, easily manipulated cases. The way we do that is keep the design super simple in a toolless uh, assembly. Everything to be assembled is done with simple pins that you can push and pull in. Uh, the, the drone is designed to be uh, environmentally sound, so it can fly with light wind and dust, light rain, so everything is contained on the inside of the drone or has IP rated connections. The drone flies in autonomous or semi-autonomous modes, um, meaning you, if you can pick waypoints on a map, you can fly this drone. In the current configuration, it's designed to carry multiple jerry cans. Um, in other configurations, we can have a payload bay that can put a, a wide variety of supplies or uh, supplies inside. On top, you have a replaceable battery pod. This is lithium ion batteries that uh, can be charged in about two and a half hours to give you your full flight time. You can pop the battery pod off, pop a new one on, and you're ready to fly another mission. The drones that you see today are either gonna be hobby grade drones that are toys, things used for filming real estate or family vacations, or you get your high altitude military grade drones that are doing uh, long range reconnaissance and ISR missions. This middle area that we're building drones uh, are purpose built, mission built, based on what that customer or organization needs. It could be resupply, it could be ISR, it could be communications relays, but everything we build is designed around what that customer is looking to do. So challenges that we had to overcome while developing the Mark IV RX 
uh, was the integration of, of sensors and radios and technology that has never been integrated before. And then also when you're dealing with power and lift capabilities of this size, uh, the propulsion system is using a lot of energy that's never been used on aircraft this size. But when you do that, you're providing an aircraft that is best for the missions uh, that are needed. And while a lot of this is still experimentation, the evaluations are going quite quickly. So Marines could actually see this gear and this capability fielded in the next couple of years. I'm, Marine, I'm Todd South with Military Times reporting from Leesburg, Virginia with producer Daniel Woolfolk. Thanks, Todd. In other news, more developments in the case of slain Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen at Fort Hood, Texas in 2020. A new investigation confirms that Guillen was sexually harassed by a supervisor and made two informal complaints, though no action was taken. The Army had previously said there was no evidence of harassment. Those incidents were not connected to her death. The investigation also details how her alleged killer escaped by running away from a guard left to keep him under watch following the discovery of Guillen's body. Now over to the Coast Guard, where crews responded to a potentially deadly situation of a boat fire 85 miles off the coast of Massachusetts. Video of the operation shows coasties from Air Station Cape Cod pulling fishermen from churning water near the burning boat. And finally, the Royal Marines and U.S. Navy are digging into human flight with sea trials of a new jet suit. The latest test of the mind-bending tech for sea assaults was tweeted out by the head of the British Navy recently, and it is eye-popping. The official title of the head of the British Navy, by the way, First Sea Lord. Do with that information what you will. That's it from the military this week. When we come back, we learn about the Royal Air Force's expectations for a common jet fuel standard and how it plans to get ahead of the United Kingdom's plan to be carbon neutral. The military and defense market is constantly evolving. Stay on top of the latest news with Sightline Media Group's live events. Continue to learn, understand new tools and technologies. We're live, you're on in three. Defense, two, government, one. and industry leaders come together for successful and proven engaging events. You'll gain valuable insight, get the chance to ask questions, all from the comfort of your own home or office. Sign up for our events newsletters and receive alerts for upcoming live streams. In this week's Actionable Intelligence, we continue our conversation with the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force's top officer. Defense News' Aaron Mehta spoke to Sir Mike Wigston about the common fuel standards for planes, as well as how the service expects to meet or exceed the UK's goal to become carbon neutral. 
You know, you mentioned the supply chain issue, which has been an issue in the past when the U.S. at least has experimented, the Navy in particular, experimented with uh, alternative fuel sources. Uh, one of the big concerns we heard was this constant litany of, okay, but what if, you know, you don't want to have it be reliable on this source of fuel that might not be available out in the field or might not be easily accessible in the field. You know, you mentioned also your air chief, working with the other air chiefs. I'm wondering if there's a way uh, that you're at least looking at or, or talking to your fellow air chiefs about trying to get everyone on kind of a common, uh, I don't want to say common fuel source, but, you know, at least get more and more buy into these alternative fuels to be able to make sure that the supply chain is robust across the world, given how many co-operations, joint operations are done. Yes. So there's two elements to that. The first one is recognizing that, uh, that, the, um, that the commercial aviation sector has got an enormous part to play in this. And so for all of our, so for all of our nations, uh, the UK, the US, all around the world, it's got to be a cross-government initiative. And in the UK, we've, we've established under the Prime Minister uh, a Jet Zero Council, which is primarily about civil aviation. And it's about uh, driving the commercial aviation sector down to a net zero position. And a large part of that is about uh, commercializing synthetic fuel production and making sure that it's available at the pumps on the, uh, uh, around the, uh, the civil airspace infrastructure. So, so military air forces can take advantage of that. The second thing is exactly as you say, the uh, pulling together uh, the air chiefs and, and agreeing a, a common ambition. And that's something that uh, we are proposing to our uh, uh, to fellow air chiefs over the next few months. And so that by the end of the year, I would like to hope, and, and I'm certainly aiming for a common declaration amongst global air chiefs that um, these are the steps that we're going to take collectively because this is the only way that I think we're going to achieve this to get to a position where we are consuming um, far less hydrocarbons in, in fuel terms. But, but of course, as, as any expert in this, and I don't pretend to be an expert in this, but as any expert in this would say, you know, your, your fuel burn, your hydrocarbon fuel burn is just the start of it. And, and we've got a long way to go across all sectors of our business. Do you have a target date in mind for net zero for the RAF? So, our, so the, the, the United Kingdom actually legislated that we would be uh, net zero by 2050. And so that's by law. So, so there's, a, there's a backstop there of 2050 for me. I've actually set the target to my team of 2040. And uh, because that's in part because I, I have a hunch that, uh, target, that, that, that these dates might need to come forward. Uh, because as the you know, as, as we've seen in Washington this week, as people as this becomes more more of a pressing issue and 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 becomes uh, you know the, the, uh, to the level of being recognised as a crisis in people's minds, then people will demand perhaps net zero even earlier. So I've set the target of 2040 for the Royal Air Force, and my team are, are working on that now, and that will require additional investment that and, and it will require me diverting investment from. Uh, from equipment and platforms into infrastructure and into how we operate. But I think that's a price that we're going to have to accept that we're going to have to pay. And, and I see a leading role for the Royal Air Force in that. Great. Well, sir, Mike, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you chatting with us and uh, hope to see you again soon. Yeah, Aaron, that's been a, it's been a great pleasure. And I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Aaron. Now for defense industry headlines. The French DJ military procurement agency successfully test-fired the M51.2 strategic ballistic missile on April 28 from its Biscruits test site on France's Atlantic coast. The missile, central to France's nuclear deterrence policy, wasn't carrying a warhead, and the test met its treaty requirements according to the Ministry for the Armed Forces. Although the M51.2 missile is already operational, it's regularly tested. Data and lessons learned from the test are used for development of the next increment of the missile, the M51.3, which is scheduled for delivery to the French Navy in 2025. This version should have a range several hundred kilometers beyond the capacity of the M51.2, and it will equip the four third-generation nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines that will replace the Le Tramfant class in 2035. The DGA's missile test team followed the missile until it landed in the North Atlantic. The 61 M51 is the key component to the French Strategic Ocean Force. Each missile can carry 6 to 10 independently targetable TN-75 thermonuclear warheads. The prime contractor for the program is Ariane Group. 
The Biden administration approved a trio of potential foreign military sales cases for Australia and India for items worth a potential $4.36 billion for American companies. Australia was cleared to purchase a package of heavy armored combat systems with an estimated price tag of nearly $1.7 billion and four CH-47F Chinook cargo helicopters worth about $259 million. India was cleared to purchase six P-8I maritime surveillance aircraft worth an estimated $2.2 billion. The potential sales go to two key allies for the U.S. as it's increasingly focused on the Pacific. Both nations are part of the Quad, a group of like-minded partners that also includes the United States and Japan. Foreign military sales notification figures are potential arms sales that are State Department, that the State Department internally cleared, then passed to Congress through the Defense Security Cooperation Agency. One thing to note is that these notifications aren't final sales. They'll go to negotiations where dollar figures and quantities of equipment can change. The Pentagon announced that it would cancel all of the border construction projects funded by siphoning off from the Department of Defense to build military schools, training facilities, and more. A DOD spokesperson announced that the agency has begun taking all necessary actions to cancel border projects and to coordinate with its interagency partners. In total, the Pentagon put $11 billion of its budget into border construction after then-President Donald Trump made a declaration of emergency at the border. About $1.2 billion was awarded to build 97 miles of wall, according to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And that's it in industry news. When we return, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack shows you the best time to get a personal loan. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives her latest tips on the best time to get a personal loan. The nice thing about a personal loan is it's up to you how you use it. Think of it as the Swiss Army knife in your financial toolbox. But any money expert will tell you you've got to know when and how to use it. Unlike a mortgage or an auto loan, your personal loan isn't earmarked for a specific purchase, so you can use it for something like a home remodel or to cover unexpected expenses. Another way people use personal loans is for debt consolidation. This can really be helpful in simplifying your finances, consolidating multiple credit card balances into one monthly payment. It saves money and maybe even your credit score. You really shouldn't use a personal loan for everyday spending. Use your budgeting skills and discretionary income for that. The same goes for vacations. A personal loan should help you with large or unexpected purchases or improving your living situation. Most banks and credit unions make it easy to apply for and get personal loans through digital banking. Check with yours to see what options are available and remember to use your best judgment and your personal loan wisely. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more of our coverage, be sure to check out our headlines online at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com. To get a list of our top stories every morning in your inbox, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And when we come back, more from the C4ISRNet conference, where we learn about the U.S. Navy's plan for information warfare at sea. Welcome back. The U.S. Navy is testing information warfare cells during an exercise later this year. That's some of what we learned at our recent C4ISRNet conference, where reporter Mark Palmerlow spoke to the Navy's top information warfare officer, Vice Admiral Jeffrey Trussler, about the services plan. The CNO has previously discussed this notion of potentially piloting information warfare cells you know, at the fleet level. I don't know if there's anything you can offer about that, that concept or, or where it's at or just the notion of, of what an uh, information warfare cell uh, looks like. Oh, uh, great question. And uh, I think that uh, you know, that concept is being talked about right now because we've been so successful with our information warfare commander at sea on the strike group. Something started back in 2017 is uh, it, it is now uh, uh, solidified. Every strike group has uh, one of our composite warfare commanders as we divide up the warfare areas in a strike group. One of them is now is the information warfare commander. And so we've taken somebody, instead of sort of the uh, classic Napoleonic structure of how staffs are organized and how information and problems uh, are dealt with and solved, so in that arena where I just talked about common operational picture, how we're going to take advantage of the electromagnetic spectrum, when we should transmit, when we shouldn't, when we should radiate radars, when we shouldn't, 
uh, taking into it, uh, seamlessly pulling in the, uh, the intelligence, seamlessly pulling in the oceanographic and meteorological data to how we might use that to our advantage. So instead of taking, uh, you know, classic warfare officers, having them integrate among several, we've now put this IWC in place. Hey, that is your job integrate this these disciplines and environments into the best decision space so that the commander can take advantage of point at one unit one cell one one commander and uh, take recommendations or give orders to that can affect some of those things it's worked out uh, very well uh, i talk to every strike group commander that comes through the pentagon i ask him specifically how is that uh, uh, iwc concept you know, working and to a man, every man or woman, every one of them love their IWC uh, and love, love that concept. And now it's been ingrained so long now, four years, I think we're going to kind of lose track of how did we used to do this before. So, so successful out there. What about our maritime operations centers at the big, uh, you know, the, the fleet where the fleet commanders operate, uh, the joint force military maritime component commanders, those big where the decisions are made, where the operational level of war takes place. The same concept is being discussed. Should we have an IWC construct here? Little and different environment that out with the strike group. Uh, but the concept merit some discussion. We're having that discussion right now. Uh, it will even be uh, uh, experimented with during the large scale uh, exercise that the Navy is going to conduct uh, later this year. We're going to, uh, one of our uh, fleet commanders is going to test that concept out in their maritime operations center. And we're going to take some feedback from that uh, and look at it. So uh, it, we think it's a powerful concept. We think it's just a continued maturation of the information age, and we need to manage that information differently, not only with the tools we want to develop, but with how we process that in the decision making of a commander and his staff. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on MilitaryTimes.com and DefenseNews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.